Hello and welcome to Money Trail. Today, the international banking cartel, from the Rothschilds to the House of Morgan to the Federal Reserve, who controls the world's money? The four horsemen of banking, Bank of America, JP Morgan Chase, Citigroup, and Wells Fargo own the four horsemen of oil, Exxon Mobil, Royal Dutch Shell, BP, and Chevron Texaco. In tandem with Deutsche Bank, BMP, Barclays, and other European old money behemoths, but their monopoly over the global economy does not end at the edge of the oil patch. According to company 10K filings to the SEC, the four horsemen of banking are among the top 10 stockholders of virtually every Fortune 500 corporation. The fact is 52% of the New York Fed is owned by these eight families. It's the Rockefellers, Rothschilds, Goldman Sachs, Lehman's, Lazard's, Warburg's, Kuhn Loeb's, and Israel Moses Seif's. And the latter family, that goes back to the Genoese bankers when they first moved into Europe. And these are just really old families. And you know the saying, money begets more money. You know, you got to have money to make money. Well, guess what? These people had money in the 16th century. Many people estimate that the Rothschilds, the richest of these families, are worth over $100 trillion. The international banking cartel is a consortium of about 15 to 20 to 25 international banks of large magnitude with um, large amounts of political influence. These are the too big to fail banks around the world. They're too big to fail. They're too big to jail. And they are the ones who control the private central banks of the world because in most countries, United States, Britain, Germany, Japan, and so on down the line. The central bank is a privately controlled institution, even if it's not always formally speaking privately owned. The control that these banking families exert over the global economy cannot be overstated and is quite intentionally shrouded in secrecy. Their corporate media arm is quick to discredit any information exposing this private central banking cartel as conspiracy theory, yet the facts remain. And what my book is about is how they've established this total monopoly over the three most valuable commodities in the world, guns, drugs, and oil. And then, worse yet, they've taken over the central banks of every country, not just the Federal Reserve, but Bank of England, the Bundesbank, the Bank of France, Bank of Australia, I mean, you name it. It's just stranger than fiction that this can happen, but these banking cartels with our fiat currency system where they can print more money, lend out more money than they actually have in reserve, and the government backs it. We have the Royal Bank of Scotland, we have HSBC, that's the old Hong Kong Shanghai Banking Corporation, Lloyds Bank TSB, that has absorbed HBOS, Building Society, that is followed then by Bank of America, Citigroup, JP Morgan Chase, UBS, Credit Suisse, Deutsche Bank and Westdeutsche Landesbank of Germany, Société Générale of France, the Bank of Tokyo Mitsubishi UJF, Norin Chukin of Japan, Royal Bank of Canada, and Rabobank of the Netherlands. Now that group, 15, 16 banks, that is the heart of the cartel. One important repository for the wealth of the global oligarchy that owns these bank holding companies is U.S. Trust Corporation, founded in 1853 and now owned by Bank of America. A recent U.S. Trust corporate director and honorary trustee was Walter Rothschild. Other directors included Daniel Davison of J.P. Morgan Chase, Richard Tucker of ExxonMobil, Daniel Roberts of Citigroup, and Marshall Schwartz of Morgan Stanley. Basically, it's like these families are running this printing press, and they get countries in debt, they get individuals in debt, they get companies in debt, and when those people go into debt and can't pay their loans back, then these bankers come in and seize the real asset, which is the house, the car, the Mexican National Cement Company, which is what they did in the Mexican debt crisis in 1997. The way they got out of that was they handed over other state assets to Asarco and BNN, took over the whole railroad in Mexico, and it's just a scam. And now the world's biggest and perhaps oldest modern banking family. Ladies and gentlemen, the Rothschilds. In 1694, William III teamed up with the UK aristocracy to launch the private bank of England. The Rothschilds and their inbred eight families' partners gradually came to control the Bank of England. Mayor Amschel Rothschild once said, quote, I hear not who controls a nation's political affairs so long as I control her currency. When Amsho Meyer Bauer inherited the business, he decided to change his name to Rothschild. Amsho soon learned that loaning money to governments and kings was more profitable than loaning to private individuals. Not only were the loans bigger, but they were secured by the nation's taxes. 
Mayor Rothschild had five sons. He trained them all in the skills of money creation, then sent them out to the major capitals of Europe to open branch offices of the family banking business. His first son, Amsho Mayer, stayed in Frankfurt to mine the hometown bank. His second son, Solomon, was sent to Vienna. His third son, Nathan, was clearly the most clever. He was sent to London at age 21, in 1798, a hundred years after the founding of the Bank of England. His fourth son, Carl, went to Naples, and his fifth son, Jacob, went to Paris. Rothschild soon grew unbelievably wealthy. By the mid-1800s, they dominated all European banking and were certainly the wealthiest family in the world. The Rothschild family was a German banking family. Their original name was Bauer. They changed their name to Rothschild. The sons of Mayor Amschel, Bauer Rothschild, were spread out across Europe. They funded all sides of all conflicts. The most famous instance of that is when they funded the Duke of Wellington and Bonaparte's army. And they financed the Crimean War and they financed Napoleon and Wellington, both sides of that conflict. But that was the pattern. They started getting the royal families of Europe into debt to them so they'd owe them money. The Rothschild family seized control of the Bank of England the first privately owned central bank in a major European nation and the wealthiest, by the mid-1800s, the Rothschilds were the richest family in the world bar none. Over two centuries, disguising what they're doing, disguising what the ownership of their corporations is, there is no reliable information on the magnitude of their wealth in this day and age. Author Frederick Martin estimates that by 1850, the Rothschilds were worth over $10 billion. Some researchers believe that their fortune today exceeds $100 trillion. That's how the Rothschilds started, was by funding these wars in Europe. And they just gained power, gained power. The Rockefellers in America were financed by the Rothschilds, along with the Kuhn Loeb family. They financed Cecil Rhodes, making it possible for him to establish a monopoly over the diamond and gold fields of South Africa. In America, they financed the Harrimans and railroads, the Vanderbilts and railroads and the press, and Carnegie in the steel industry, among many others. In fact, during World War I, J.P. Morgan was thought to be the richest man in America. But after his death, it was discovered that he was actually only a lieutenant of the Rothschilds. By 1850, James Rothschild, the heir of the French branch of the family, was said to be worth 600 million French francs, 150 million more than all the other bankers in France put together. He built this mansion called Ferrier, just east of Paris. Wilhelm I, on seeing it, exclaimed, kings couldn't afford this. It could only belong to a Rothschild. At the heart of the whole Rothschild money accumulation was that relationship they had with these royals. And then they started acquiring control of all these central banks. And once again, once you have a billion dollars, easy to make 10 billion. Once you have 10 billion, 100 billion is nothing. Once you have that, 100 trillion is nothing. Today, the Rothschilds control a far-flung financial empire, which includes majority states and most world central banks. They are founding members of the exclusive $10 trillion club of the Isles, which controls corporate giants, Royal Dutch Shell, Imperial Chemical Industries, Lloyds of London, Unilever, Barclays, Lorno, Rio Tinto Zinc, BHB Billiton. The club of Isles is led by the Rothschilds and includes Queen Elizabeth II and other wealthy European aristocrats and black nobility. It dominates the world's supply of petroleum, gold, diamonds, and many other vital raw materials. You can't tell the difference between the Rothschilds and the Royals. It's all the same stuff. They have joint investments. How about the American version of the Rothschilds? Who started banking in the U.S.? The House of Morgan presided over American finance from the corner of Wall Street, acting as quasi-U.S. central bank since 1838, when George Peabody founded it in London. The Morgan financial octopus wrapped its tentacles quickly around the globe. Morgan Grenfell operated in London. Morgan at Sioux ruled Paris. The Rothschild's Lambert cousins set up Drexel and Company in Philadelphia. The House of Morgan financed the launch of AT&T, General Motors, General Electric, and DuPont. Like the London-based Rothschild and Barings banks, Morgan became part of a power structure in many countries. Morgan was 
the official U.S. representative of the city of London and British banking. He was London's man in New York City. This gave him dominant power. A recession in 1893 enhanced Morgan's power. That year, Morgan saved the U.S. government from a bank panic, forming a syndicate to prop up government reserves with a shipment of $62 million worth of Rothschild gold. The origin of the situation we're in now, right? Where, where do we get this world banking cartel and how do they control the finances and the central banks of these countries? It actually takes us back to 1895. This was an attack on the United States organized by London and by Morgan. The goal was to force the U.S. off the gold standard by buying up all the gold that was the backing of the U.S. dollar. And at the height of the crisis, there's a meeting between Grover Cleveland and the current Morgan of those days. Grover Cleveland was the president of the United States. And Morgan said, London and I demand to control the U.S. public debt. And if you do that, we'll stop attacking the dollar. But if you don't, we'll wreck the dollar, we'll cause a depression, and that will be the end of you. And at that point, Grover Cleveland surrendered to London and to Morgan. Morgan was a driving force behind Western expansion in the U.S., financing and controlling westbound railroads through voting trusts. The House of Morgan was cozy with the British House of Benzer and the Italian House of Savoy, the Kuhn Lopes, Warburgs, Lehmans, Lazards, Israel Moses Seifs, and Goldman Sachs also had close ties to European royalty. By 1895, Morgan controlled the flow of gold in and out of the U.S. The House of Morgan financed half the U.S. World War I effort while receiving commissions for lining up contractors like GE, DuPont, U.S. Steel, Kennecott, and Sarko. Morgan also financed the British Boer War in South Africa and the Franco-Prussian War. The 1919 Paris Peace Conference was presided over by Morgan, which led both German and Allied reconstruction efforts. Money makes strange bedfellows. How the Morgans and Rockefellers came together. In 1879, Cornelius Vanderbilt's Morgan financed New York Central Railroad gave preferential shipping rates to John D. Rockefeller's budding standard oil monopoly, cementing the Rockefeller-Morgan relationship. Morgan and Edward Harriman's banker, Kung Loeb, held a monopoly over the railroads, while banking dynasties Lehman, Goldman Sachs, and Lazar joined the Rockefellers in controlling the U.S. industrial base. The Morgans financed all the railroads. Rockefeller at that time was just another guy on the oil patch, and what he did is he cut deals with the railroads based on volume that they would transport his crude at a better rate than other people got. Not only that, but he started selling oil below cost to refiners. And what that did is it drove a lot of wildcatters out of business in Texas, Louisiana, because you can't sell oil for less than the price it costs to produce, right? Unless you're John Rockefeller. And so he ran them out of business and then he bought all the refineries. But that's the most notable instance where JP Morgan, early on with the railroads, helped the Rockefeller family and vice versa. What you have now is JP Morgan Chase. So see, the Chase Bank has always been the Rockefeller Bank, the big one along with Citigroup, but the Citigroup, James Stillman and some other families that have big chunks of that, Harkness family, but Chase has always been the Rockefeller Bank. In the insurance business, the Rockefellers control metropolitan life, equitable life, prudential and New York life. The Rockefeller banks control 25% of all assets of the 50 largest U.S. commercial banks and 30% of all assets of the 50 largest insurance companies. Speaking of the international banking cartel, how about the U.S. Federal Reserve? Where does the Fed stand? The Federal Reserve is a center of it. It's really one of the governing institutions. Everyone who can read the writing on the wall can see the Federal Reserve Bank controls the United States government. They control every aspect of the economy. And they are controlled by a international bank according to the rules that everybody knows, Basel III. That's the rules by which all the private central banks operate. And it's set in a foreign country, which means the Federal Reserve Bank is a treasonous institution that destroys or has destroyed American sovereignty, as has the European Central Bank and the banks around the world, as has every nation where these Rothschild central banks operate out of. How about the central bank of all central banks? The Bank for International Settlements in Basel, Switzerland. The Bank for International Settlements is the most powerful bank in the world, a global central bank for the eight families who control the private central banks of almost all Western and developing nations. The Bank for International Settlements is owned by the Federal Reserve, Bank of England, Bank of Italy, Bank of Canada, Swiss National Bank, Netherlands Bank, Bundesbank, and Bank of France. 
naturally it's a sinister institution, right? Secretive, wealthy, with no accountability, no transparency, no TV cameras, no nothing, all secret. This is the kind of thing that would have to end. It's hard to find out about it, for sure. This BIS crowd, Bank of International Settlements, it's in Basel, Switzerland. It's a central bank for central bankers. It keeps its head low. It's owned by the same families, and it only comes out in times of extreme crisis. The Bank for International Settlements has been operating in Basel since 1931. The Young Plan of 1931-32, which also created the Bank for International Settlement. Historian Carol Quigley wrote in his epic book Tragedy and Hope the Bank for International Settlements was part of a plan to, quote, create a world system of financial control and private hands able to dominate the political system of each country and the economy of the world as a whole to be controlled in a feudalistic fashion by the central banks of the world acting in concert by secret agreements. The international banking cartel that controls the central banks of all but three nations operates under the rules set by something, an international body called the Bank for International Settlements in Basel, Switzerland. The central banks of the world from the United States to Russia to China, they all operate under Basel III is what's being transitioned into now, and Basel III is the rules by which all of these banks operate. There's complex organizations, international organizations, and secret societies that carry out the will of these banks, and the leadership of those groups are the major stockholders of the Bank for International Settlements. The Bank for International Settlements holds at least 10% of monetary reserves for at least 80 of the world's central banks, the IMF, and other multilateral institutions. It serves as financial agent for international agreements, collects information on the global economy, and serves as lender of last resort to prevent global financial collapse. It served as conduit for eight families funding of Adolf Hitler, led by Warburg's Henry Schroeder and Mendelssohn Bank of Amsterdam. Many researchers assert the Bank for International Settlements is a donator of global drug money laundering. It's a banking cartel that prints money out of thin air and charges people interest and leverages its war machine, which exhibits itself in the Russian military, the United States military, the Chinese military, and they play different nationalities of people off of one another in order to enslave the planet and consolidate their power. Politicians often declare wars, but who are the true warmongers? Who are the people that fund the wars? Who are the true war profiteers? The controlling of the money supply and the economy is only a portion of the power the international bankers wield against us. The next tool for profit and control is war. Since the inception of the Federal Reserve in 1913, it seems as if we have been in a perpetual war at one place or another. There's a reason for this. It's important to understand that the most lucrative thing that can happen for the international bankers is war. For it forces the country to borrow even more money from the Federal Reserve Bank at interest. Not only that, but they have heavy investments in the weapons manufacturers. Guns, drugs, oil. If you look at the numbers, it's the three most valuable commodities in the world. If you're a banker, you're gonna want war. You can sell oil to both sides, you can sell guns to both sides, and you can run drugs through the war zone and nobody will know where it's going and launder that money easily. Big old stacks of $100 bills, also gold and diamonds, all these things go through war zones as currency. And of course, they own the defense contractors. That same families own Lockheed Martin, they own BAE, British Aerospace, they own all the biggest defense contractors. Speaking of the international banking cartel, where does the U.S. Federal Reserve stand? How did it come to being? By the early 20th century, the U.S. had already implemented and removed a few private bank systems, which were swindled into place by ruthless banking interests. At this time, the dominant families in the banking corporate worlds were the Rockefellers, the Morgans, the Warburgs, and the Rothschilds. In the early 1900s, they sought again to publish legislation to create another central bank. However, they knew the government and the public were wary of such institutions, so they needed to create an incident to affect public opinion. In 1907, J.P. Morgan published rumors that the Knickerbocker Trust Company was insolvent. This was a deliberate act of market manipulation which precipitated the Panic of 1907, 
This led to an eruption of bankruptcies, repossessions, and failures. Unaware of the fraud, the panic led to a congressional investigation headed by Senator Nelson Aldridge. Aldridge had intimate ties to the banking cartels, and he was the insider the banking cartels desperately needed. The commission led by Aldridge recommended a central bank should be implemented so the panic of 1907 would never happen again. This was the jumpstart the international bankers needed. In 1910, a secret meeting was held at the J.P. Morgan estate on Jekyll Island off the coast of Georgia. During the 1910 Jekyll Isle meeting, it was the Morgan Rothschild Rockefeller Alliance, and they worked closely throughout the late 1800s right through the 1910, 1915 period. So they were dominant in that day and age. Those were the three major banking families. It was there that the central banking bill, called the Federal Reserve Act, was drafted. The bill was written by bankers for bankers. The meeting was held in complete secrecy. After the bill was constructed, it was then handed to their political spokesperson, Senator Nelson Ulrich, and he pushed it through Congress. And in 1913, with heavy sponsorship by the bankers, Woodrow Wilson became president, having already agreed to sign the Federal Reserve Act in exchange for campaign support. And two days before Christmas, while the majority of Congress was away for the holidays, the Federal Reserve Act was voted in and President Wilson signed it into law. Starting with 1913 and the passage of the Federal Reserve Act, we have privately owned central banks whose sole mission is to disguise themselves as operating in the public interest, when in fact they operate strictly in the interest of the member banks, the member private commercial banks. So we have this giant veneer of a deception going on, and that is the main problem. If we actually had central banks that were operating in the public interest, and we did not have the specter of private commercial banks being able to counterfeit the national money through fractional reserve lending, everybody would be a lot better off. The public was told that the Federal Reserve System would give them financial stability. As history has shown, nothing could be further from the truth. The fact is, the international bankers now had a streamlined machine to carry out their private agendas. For example, between 1914 and 1919, the Fed doubled the money supply, which led to extensive loans to small businesses and the public. Then in 1920, the Fed called in the remaining outstanding money supply, which resulted in panic and loans being called in. This led to bank runs and bank failures. Over 5,400 competitive banks, not within the Federal Reserve banking system, collapsed. The Fed sucked these banks up in a hurry, furthering their sphere of influence and power. Charles Lindbergh had stepped up and said after the creation of the Federal Reserve, from now on, depressions will be scientifically created. And as we shall see, this statement was more prophetic than arbitrary. The big bankers were just getting warmed up and they had a bigger plan to unveil on the American people. Between 1921 and 1929, the Fed again increased the money supply by over 60%, which once again led to extensive loans to the public, companies, and banks. There was also a new concept called a margin loan in the stock market. Very simply, a margin loan would allow an investor to buy a stock with only 10% down. The remainder of the stock would be carried by the broker. In other words, I could buy $1,000 worth of stock with only $100 down. This was very popular during the Roaring Twenties and everyone seemed to be making money, lots of money. However, there was a catch to this loan. When the stock dips below a certain level, the balance could be called in and must be paid within 24 hours. This is called a margin call, which usually resulted in the selling of the stock to cover the outstanding loan and whatever the investor had put into the market was lost if he or she could not meet the margin. Few months before October in 1929, J.D. Rockefeller and the other banking insiders quietly exited the market, and on October 24, 1929, the New York financiers who furnished the margin loans started calling them in. This sparked an instant massive sell-off in the market, for everyone had to cover the margin loans. It caused runs on banks, which caused the collapse of over 16,000 banks. 
These international bankers were not only able to suck up these independent rival banks, but also whole corporations for pennies on the dollars. It was the biggest robbery in U.S. history. We have in this country one of the most corrupt institutions the world has ever known. I refer to the Federal Reserve Board and the Federal Reserve Banks, here and after called the Fed. They are not government institutions. They are private monopolies which prey upon the people of the United States for the benefit of themselves and their foreign customers. The Federal Reserve is bad because of what it does, but what it does is influenced by the fact that it's privately owned. It needs to be nationalized. Federalize the Fed, nationalize it, seize it, deprivatize it, take it over in whole or in part. It didn't stop there. Instead of expanding the money supply, the Fed actually contracted the money supply, fueling the largest depression in U.S. history. Once again outraged by the acts of the Fed, Lewis McFadden brought about impeachment hearings against President Herbert Hoover, and he also introduced a resolution bringing conspiracy charges against the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve, saying that the crash of 1929 and the following depression was a carefully contrived occurrence. Are you going to let these thieves get off scot-free? Is there one law for the looter who drives up to the door of the United States Treasury in his limousine? Not surprising, after two failed attempts, Louis McFadden was assassinated by means of poisoning at a banquet in 1936. Having reduced the society to squalor, the Federal Reserve decided it was time to strip the people of all their remaining wealth. Under the pretense of ending the Depression, came the 1933 gold seizure. Under the threat of imprisonment for 10 years, everyone in the United States had to turn in their gold coins, bullion, and gold certificates. And by the end of 1933, the gold standard was abolished and the people received a Federal Reserve note which is not backed by anything. Before 1933, the dollar stated it was redeemable in gold. After 1933, it is just legal tender. It is worthless paper. The only thing that gives it value is the amount of notes in circulation. Abracadabra, how the Fed creates money out of thin air. The central bank is an institution that produces a currency for an entire country. Two powers are inherent in central banking practices. Number one, they control the interest rates, and number two, they control the money supply and inflation. The central bank does not print the money supply and hand it over to the country. Instead, the central bank prints the money and loans it to the country at interest. Then through increasing and decreasing the money supply, the central bank regulates the value of the currency being issued. It is critical to understand that the long-term product of the central banking system is debt. We don't print money here in this country. We borrow every penny of it, with the exception of coin money, which is a very small percentage. The problem is the national debt, which is our national money, every bit of it is borrowed into existence primarily from commercial banks. It doesn't take a genius to figure out this Ponzi scheme. First of all, the United States does not print or own any of these Federal Reserve notes you may have in your wallet. Every single dollar printed is loaned to us at interest. This means that every single dollar printed already has a certain percentage of debt attached to it. So all this borrowing and all this printing has led to over 16 trillion dollars of U.S. federal debt. So who are the debtors and who are the creditors? And what are the long-term, medium-term, short-term consequences of this debt? 60% of government debt is purchased by banks and related industries. They own the majority of the debt and certainly controlling interest of the debt, and thereby they control the political process as well. The American people need to take to the streets chanting no more national debt. You don't have to run a nation on debt. You don't have to have a national debt. It's the most important responsibility and power of a sovereign nation to create its own money in the public interest. If you go out and ask the average citizen on the street who creates the money in the country, they will inevitably answer the government. They say that because they intuitively know that that is government's most important responsibility. And yet, in virtually no nation on earth is that the case. Since the central bank has a monopoly on the production of the currency being issued, 
and they loan each dollar with immediate debt attached to it, where does the money come from to pay off the debt? The answer is simple. It can only come from the central bank. They just print more money. If a president wants to stimulate the economy by infusing $700 billion into the economy, or he wants to pay $800 billion for a universal health care system, well, the president can't reach into the congressional pocketbook because they are already in debt over their heads. So instead, they request that the Federal Reserve print the $700 or $800 billion they need. But the Federal Reserve doesn't just print the money free of charge. Instead, they add on or print extra to cover the percentage for services rendered, and they pocket the excess. Quantitative easing, that's the technical buzzword for printing more and more money. We've had QE1, QE2, and now QE3 to the tune of $40 billion a month. Q1, Q2, all it is is sinking the United States of America further into debt. The only people it does any good is the traders on Wall Street, same banks, because they can take that zero interest money that they're being given and they can put it into oil futures and corn futures. And you wonder why you're paying more at the store and you wonder why you're paying more at the gas station. We've reached a point in world history that we've never reached before. We've reached debt saturation. And what that means is that uh, further quantitative easing, in other words, just merely dumping hot money into the top of the system instead of the bottom, into the top, the financial sector, is now no longer producing an increase in GDP. For the first time in world history, it's actually depressing GDP. But hey, guess what? They're a one-trick pony. That's the only trick they know because they are trapped in the debt money box. So we're doomed to a slow spiraling depression and there's nothing that can be done until the next big tip over in the stock market and then people in the United States States at least will realize that the answers that have been offered are not working and they're going to look elsewhere for something else. But exactly how federal is the U.S. Federal Reserve System? Once again, it is important to understand that the Federal Reserve is a private institution. As the well-known saying goes, it is as federal as Federal Express. It is a private bank that loans us a currency at interest. It is completely consistent with the banking model our founding fathers escaped from by declaring independence in the American Revolutionary War. I believe the banking institutions are more dangerous to our liberties than standing armies. Already they have raised up a moneyed aristocracy that has set the government at defiance. The issuing power should be taken away from the banks and restored to the people to whom it properly belongs. Thomas Jefferson the only federal part of the Federal Reserve is the Federal Reserve Board of Governors. And that is a board that's appointed by the administration, but they're all bankers. So the Federal Board of Governors is all bankers, they're all private bankers. Every other part of the Fed is private, and it's not some big conspiracy, it's just the facts. It's just, see, every bank in America has been coaxed into this Federal Reserve system. So every, even your local banks, they're all part of it. They're all part of this Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve System is, of course, illegal. It's unconstitutional because the Constitution gives the Congress the right and the responsibility to control money supply. They have given this over to the Federal Reserve. That's bad enough. But then some of the people voting in the Federal Open Market Committee are from the branches, Chicago, San Francisco, St. Louis, other Federal Reserve branches. And those are just private bankers. They've never been approved by the Senate. They've never been appointed by the president. So this is completely lawless. It means that private interests have taken over government function. So who watches the Federal Reserve System and its member banks? Regardless of whatever is written in code, the Federal Reserve really has no oversight. And they are not really bound by a checks and balance system like the three branches of our government. So without audits, it's impossible to know how much the Federal Reserve is actually printing, who they are loaning it to, and any potential conflicts of interest. Henry Ford said about the Federal Reserve, It is well that the people of the nation do not understand our banking and monetary system. For if they did, I believe there would be a revolution before tomorrow morning. In front of a session of Congress, the President and Vice President of the Federal Reserve Bank have stated to 
members of Congress that they're not even going to tell them how many trillions of dollars were lent out during a short period of time. They're not going to tell them where the money went, what the interest was on the loan, or if it was a loan, what the collateral was on these multi-trillions of dollars. The power to regulate the money supply is also the power to regulate its value, which is also the power that can bring entire economies and societies to its knees. Give me the control of a nation's money supply, and I care not who makes its laws. Title 31 of the U.S. Code requires an annual physical inventory of our gold supply, but a complete audit was never done. So officially, nobody knows what has occurred for the last decades. After World War II, America had 70% of the world's supply of loose gold, but today we may have less than 7%. Senator Jesse Helms seemed to think that OPEC nations have our gold, while others believe that 70% of the world's gold supply is being held by the World Bank, which is dominated by the financial grip of the Rothschilds and Rockefellers. The Federal Reserve System has never been audited, and their meetings and minutes of those meetings are not open to the public. They have repelled all attempts to be audited. Arthur Burns, the chairman of the Federal Reserve, said that an audit would threaten the independence of the reserve. These banks need to be regulated. They cannot be regulated as long as government is borrowing money from them. And nothing else matters until you fix those two problems. Banks should not be allowed to lend governments money. Banks should not be allowed to counterfeit the national money through fractional reserve lending. The people who are running the central banking cartel in the United States, known as the Federal Reserve Bank, are guilty of treason. This is the law, and if the law is to be upheld, and it will be, that we must arrest the leaders of the Federal Reserve Banking System, the owners and the officers of the Federal Reserve Banking System. They violated Article 3, Section 3 of the U.S. Constitution. Since September 17, 2011, thousands and thousands of Americans have been on the streets across our country, blaming the big banks for the so-called Great Recession that officially started back in 2007, blaming the top banks for the joblessness, homelessness, and poverty that has gripped the nation. This march is about the banks and what they've done to the American economy. They crashed the economy with terrible investments, with speculation that really does not do anything but make them rich and make us poor. And we're protesting that. We want them to be held accountable. We want them to pay for the damage they did. Fraud should be punished by jail terms. The, the banks are responsible for the depression in two senses. This banking cartel deal in derivatives once again. Options, futures, indices, collateralized debt obligations, credit default swaps, two quadrillion of derivatives in notional value in the world, and the turnover, the buying and selling of those derivatives up to five, six, seven quadrillion, thousand trillion dollars. What happened in 2007 is the lead up to that is they found new financial innovation in order to find new markets for debt. And this came in the form of subprime borrowers looking to get on the property ladder. And so really 2007 and what's occurred since has just been perpetuating a broken system, which really the institution that's benefited pr primarily from that is anyone that's involved in banking. The banks that are in danger are the five big banks that have made huge derivative gambles. 80% of the derivatives are done by the five largest banks. And they've made a, a big gamble that stock markets and uh, real estate prices are going to go up. What's the gross domestic product of the world? It's about 70 trillion, so two quadrillion of derivatives and 70 trillion of production, and even some of that is hot air in, as well. This is impossible. The banks have created the derivatives. The reason this crisis is so much worse than previous ones is the presence of derivatives. After the Great Depression, the United States had 40 years of economic growth without a single financial crisis. The financial industry was tightly regulated. Most regular banks were local businesses, and they were prohibited from speculating with depositors' savings. Investment banks, which handled stock and bond trading, were small private partnerships. In the traditional investment banking partnership model, the partners put the money up, and obviously the partners watch that money very carefully. In December of 2000, 
Congress passed the Commodity Futures Modernization Act. Written with the help of financial industry lobbyists, it banned the regulation of derivatives. Once that was done, it was off to the races. And the use of derivatives and financial innovation exploded dramatically after 2000. By the time George W. Bush took office in 2001, the U.S. financial sector was vastly more profitable, concentrated, and powerful than ever before. Dominating this industry were five investment banks, two financial conglomerates, three securities insurance companies, and three rating agencies. And linking them all together was the securitization food chain, a new system which connected trillions of dollars in mortgages and other loans with investors all over the world. 30 years ago, if you went to get a loan for a home, the person lending you the money expected you to pay him or her back. You got a loan from a lender who wanted you to pay him back. We've since developed securitization, whereby the people who make the loan are no longer at risk if there's a failure to repay. In the old system, when a homeowner paid their mortgage every month, the money went to their local lender. And since mortgages took decades to repay, lenders were careful. In the new system, lenders sold the mortgages to investment banks. The investment banks combined thousands of mortgages and other loans, including car loans, student loans, and credit card debt, to create complex derivatives called collateralized debt obligations, or CDOs. The investment banks then sold the CDOs to investors. Now when homeowners paid their mortgages, the money went to investors all over the world. The investment banks paid rating agencies to evaluate the CDOs, and many of them were given a triple A rating, which is the highest possible investment grade. This made CDOs popular with retirement funds, which could only purchase highly rated securities. This system was a ticking time bomb. Lenders didn't care anymore about whether a borrower could repay, so they started making riskier loans. The investment banks didn't care either. The more CDOs they sold, the higher their profits. And the rating agencies, which were paid by the investment banks, had no liability if their ratings of CDOs proved wrong. You weren't going to be on the hook, and there weren't regulatory constraints. So it was a green light to just pump out more and more and more loans. Between 2000 and 2003, the number of mortgage loans made each year nearly quadrupled. Everybody in this uh, securitization food chain from the very beginning until the end, they didn't care about the quality of the mortgage. They were caring about maximizing the volume and getting a fee out of it. In the early 2000s, there was a huge increase in the riskiest loans, called subprime. But when thousands of subprime loans were combined to create CDOs, many of them still received AAA ratings. Uh, we've been continuing to perpetuate and prop up a broken system which is at the end of its time. But in 2007, the catalyst was really just decades and decades of build-up of a system where debt is perpetually increasing and banks receive a kick and a commission out of every transaction that puts people, companies and governments further into debt. What we're now left with is the zombie banks. Now, this term comes out of Japan in the 1990s, but a zombie bank is an institution that has no positive role whatsoever. Zero positive role. They do not invest. They do not put money into plant and equipment and the creation of productive jobs. They don't do commercial banking. They don't do trade financing. They don't do any of this. What do they do? Mainly, they gamble. Bail me out because I'm too big to fail. The story of bankers and politicians is as old as money in politics. Politicians are funded by the banks, and banks are bailed out by the politicians. We really have a duopoly here. The bankers and the politicians have formed this partnership. See, in order to create money out of nothing, which the Fed does, they need an act of Congress to authorize it. So that's where their buddies in Congress say, okay, we vote another trillion dollars to help the poor people of this country because we want them to have jobs. We want to give them work. So we'll create a big employment machine and we're going to create jobs. And so we'll create another trillion dollars. But nobody asks, well, where does the money come from? The politicians raise their hand. They vote for the money. They don't have the money, of course, but they vote for a trillion dollars. 
because we're going to do jobs for people. And so they get elected. They're, they're big heroes, right? But they don't realize that then the Federal Reserve says, okay, Congress has just demanded another trillion dollars. It doesn't have it. So we will create this trillion dollars because that's our part of the partnership. And we will give it to the government to spend on jobs. And where does the money come from? Well, that's a big mystery, isn't it? It comes out of thin air, which means it floods into the economy and it pushes down the purchasing power of all the other dollars that are already out there, which means inflation. That's where it comes from. So all of the people who are supposedly being benefited by jobs or whatever it is are paying for this thing out of one pocket. They put you know, $10 out of this pocket and they get $1.50 back here and they think, oh, we've been saved by our great politicians and our bankers. The biggest pools of finance for politicians to fund their campaigns, their massive campaigns. Obama reportedly had a $2 billion marketing campaign. The largest source of that finance comes from the creators of money, which is the financial and banking sector. The banks bankrupted themselves with the derivatives bubble. All bubbles burst. They should have known that. They don't want to know. They do it anyway. Like heroin addicts, right? They know it's bad, but they're going to do it anyway. When that bubble burst, the banks then turned to the governments and said, bail us out, bail us out, bail us out. And their political power and their ability to buy politicians is so great that the governments then began bankrupting themselves in order to save the zombie bank. The U.S. Treasury, not the Federal Reserve, but the Treasury, the tax money, given about a trillion dollars to the various Wall Street zombie banks. Quantitative easing, that's the technical buzzword for printing more and more money. We've had QE1, QE2, and now QE3 to the tune of $40 billion a month. QE3 was a program for the Federal Reserve to give money to the banks until Beethoven writes his 10th symphony. Q1, 2, 3, all it is is sinking the United States of America further into debt. The only people it does any good is the traders on Wall Street, same banks, because they can take that zero interest money that they're being given and they can put it into oil futures and corn futures. And you wonder why you're paying more at the store and you wonder why you're paying more at the gas station. We've reached a point in world history that we've never reached before. We've reached debt saturation. And what that means is that uh, further quantitative easing, in other words, just merely dumping hot money into the top of the system instead of the bottom, into the top, the financial sector, is now no longer producing an increase in GDP. The cover story of the giveaway to the banks is that if the Federal Reserve makes loans to the banks unlimited amounts, more than $800 billion for QE2, the banks will have enough money that they can afford to lend more mortgage money, to bid up real estate prices, to try to reinflate the bubble, and that they can lend to small businesses. The reality is that ever since QE1 and QE2, every time there's a loan, the banks reduce their loans to businesses, they reduce their mortgage loans, there's less mortgage refinancing, and in fact, the banks use the money to gamble. These bank bailouts, I think that they were diversionary tactics because when $800 billion was ordered to be given out to the banks when they were allegedly about to fail, there was about $15 trillion given out to who knows where by the Federal Reserve Bank at the same time. And then we also know that there were hundreds of trillions of dollars that were created out of thin air and then written off the books. It seems to me it's just all fake. The bailout was far bigger than the Federal Reserve let the public or even members of Congress know at the time. In fact, from the start of the financial crisis in 2007 through March of 2009, the Fed loaned or guaranteed the banks some $7.7 .7 trillion, about half the value of all the goods and services produced by the U.S. economy. That's 11 times the $700 billion in aid provided by the Treasury Department's better-known Trouble Asset Relief Program, or TARP. On just one day, December 5th, 2008, America's banks borrowed $1.2 trillion from the Fed. Furthermore, says Bloomberg, the banks borrowed that money from the Fed at as little as one hundredth of one percent interest. As a result, the banks were spared the need of selling off assets that paid much higher rates of interest. Bloomberg estimates the banks made a $13 billion profit on the spread, on money they borrowed virtually free from the Fed. So the taxpayers were told they had no option but to bail out the very same sick institutions, too big to fail, that it failed them. 
America, and for that matter, the world. Trillions of dollars went out of the taxpayers' pockets. Trillions more went out of the Fed, God knows from where. But where did the bailout money actually go? A QE2 was $800 billion, and all of QE2 was used by the banks to speculate on foreign currencies and interest rate arbitrage. Most was lent to the BRIC countries, Brazil, Russia, India, and China. The banks borrowed at one quarter of 1% and lent money to Brazil at 11% and pocketed the interest rate arbitrage. All this $800 billion, so much went out that it pushed up the value of Brazil's uh, Cruzeiro, so the banks made a foreign exchange profit on top of the interest rate arbitrage. None of this money went into the U.S. economy. The banking sector is doing a very poor job of actually taking that bailout money and redistributing it to where it's actually going to make a difference in the world, which is productive use, investment in infrastructure, investment in businesses that can create jobs, non-inflationary investment. The challenge is that that money is just going straight into bankers' bonuses, into sustaining banks' ability to lend to property and to lend to consumers. But exactly how bankrupt are the US banks? If you look at the U.S. banks in particular, right, Bank of America, J.P. Morgan Chase, which is the heart of the system, and Citibank and a couple of others, what is their current status? They should be put through Chapter 11 bankruptcy. Those are bankrupt entities. They were bankrupt in 2008. Without those cash infusions and the cheap credit, they would have been long gone. But they're politically powerful enough and their campaign contributions are big enough so that they resist that. They're not put through bankruptcy. And now the multi-trillion dollar question. If the banks are bankrupt, how could the bankers and the banking system for that matter get bigger, richer and fatter by the day? We're getting like this triple effect. One, they have the ability to create money. Secondly, they get bailed out by the banks. And thirdly, they cream interest off unsustainable lending, which is causing a triple enrichment of the banking sector, even though they're completely technically insolvent as well. Banksters at large, to this day, not a single major banker has been brought to justice. Well, the reason that we haven't had a single major player in the banking system prosecuted at the moment is simply because the banks are operating within the rules and framework by which they're allowed to operate. Some of the scandals that we're seeing is where they're loopholing the rules, they're loopholing what they're allowed to do, the reality is that they're simply doing what works within the existing laws and framework within the Bank Charter Acts, within all of the rules that have been set up for banks. So when it comes to prosecution, it's a very challenging subject because you've got these two things. You've got the people that work in the government, which are actually part of the banking system. And secondly, the government's allowing the rules to be played in this way. Regardless of whatever is written in code, the Federal Reserve really has no oversight, and they are not really bound by a checks and balance system like the three branches of our government. Congress, although not by law, has given up all its oversight responsibilities over the Fed. There are no true audits. Congress knows nothing of the conversations, the plans, and the action taken in concert with other central banks. We get less and less information regarding the money supply each year, especially now that we don't even have access to M3 statistics. The role the Fed plays in the president's secretive working group on financial markets goes unnoticed by Congress. The Federal Reserve shows no willingness to inform Congress voluntarily about how often the working group meets, what action it takes that affects the financial markets, or, or why it takes these actions. In front of a session of Congress, the president and vice president of the Federal Reserve Bank have stated to members of Congress that they're not even going to tell them how many trillions of dollars were lent out during a short period of time. They're not going to tell them where the money went, what the interest was on the loan, or if it was a loan, what the collateral was on these multi-trillions of dollars. The people who are running the central banking cartel in the United States known as the Federal Reserve Bank, are guilty of treason. So without audits, it's impossible to know how much the Federal Reserve is actually printing, who they are loaning it to, and any potential conflicts of interest. Henry Ford said about the Federal Reserve, It is well that the people of the nation do not understand our banking and monetary system. For if they did, 
I believe there would be a revolution before tomorrow morning. Thank you for watching. Always follow the money trail.